Ray Bradbury. Let's go. Well, hey there, Gracious Gang. It's Mike from thegraciousguest.org here, ready to go for another episode of The Gracious Guest Show. And today, I am so excited for this uh, this interview, to share this interview with you guys. I just recorded with my new friend, Thomas Salerno, who is a freelance writer in Long Island. Um, and we're talking about Ray Bradbury, the writing of Ray Bradbury. Uh, Ray Bradbury, who himself uh, was not exactly a, a professing sort of orthodox Christian, you know, by any stretch, but um, who had such an incredible impact on uh, 20th century literature, American culture. And, uh, you know, there's actually quite a bit in the writings of Ray Bradbury that uh, can give us a, a really interesting opportunity to consider a lot about our own nature, about our place in the universe, uh, our relationship with God, or at least a relationship with uh, our recognition of the reality that is just sort of beyond our reach a lot of times, that wants to break in, wants to... Um, you know, open our eyes to the fact that there's way more going on around us than meets the eye. Something that this sort of secular materialist um, uh, worldview kind of ignores um, to its own peril, quite frankly. And we see the effects on that in our culture at large, you know, in this uh, dehumanizing spirit that really, I think, is connected to directly and, and really maybe a result directly from pursuing a, a deadening of our imagination by accepting this nonsense, scientistic, you know, sort of worship of, of scientific knowledge, really, as, as the only way of knowing anything, or, or the, the only thing that could possibly be real is that which I can see through a telescope or put under a microscope. Um, that's reductionistic. It's, it's empty. It's, it's completely out of touch with reality. And it's one of the reasons why I do this channel. And so before we go any further, please remember, like this video if you haven't done it already. Click that little thumbs up if you're watching this video. If you're listening to the podcast, like this, share it. Uh, I love your guys' uh, positive reviews. Hopefully, if you can give me a nice review for the podcast over on iTunes, uh, hit me up on the website, thegraciousguest.org. You can get in touch with me there. You can see what I have going on. You can um, uh, invite me to come speak. There's all kinds of stuff you can engage with this mission to showcase wonder and awe. Let's jump into the interview. Thomas Salerno is a freelance writer, uh, aspiring novelist, bookworm, and all-around nerd born and raised on Long Island, New York. He received a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from Stony Brook University and worked for several years as a fossil preparator, 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 and collections assistant at the American Museum of Natural History. In his nonfiction writing, Thomas explores the intersection of speculative fiction and the Catholic faith, his work has appeared on websites such as Word on Fire, Voyage Comics, Aletea, and Busted Halo. So without further ado, let's jump right in to the first of, I think, many interviews to come with my new friend, Thomas Salerno. Check it out. Thomas Salerno, thank you so much for being my gracious guest today. Well, thank you, Mike, uh, and thanks so much for, for having me on to talk about one of my favorite authors uh, of all time, uh, Ray Bradbury. Yeah, science fiction and fantasy author. I think it's well, it's it's going to be exciting. Just looking, like I was saying to you before we started recording, some of the just the, the notes, the places we could go with it. It's so broad. So just <clears throat> see where we we get with it here. But for um, the audience here, um, unfamiliar with uh, with you and your work, kind of background, I want you to just give us a little sketch of of uh, of who you are and how you got interested in Ray Bradbury, maybe. Well, sure. I'm currently I'm actually a uh, freelance writer. And I've been writing professionally for about two years now. It, it's kind of funny. I jumped into it right as the COVID lockdown oh, okay. started. And I, because I lost my normal job that I had had. Mm. And I had always wanted to write for a long time, ever since college. And so I'm like, maybe I can fall back on this writing talent. So I've, I've mostly been doing nonfiction uh, articles over the past two years. But my, my real true love is is fiction and it's funny because i seem to be one of the few people who wasn't assigned ray bradbury's fahrenheit 451 <laughs> in in school at any time for whatever reason yeah. i don't know why but i first became familiar with him uh when i was in college i was uh in my 20s i was finishing up my anthropology degree and i was becoming fascinated with 
science fiction. I also had this un- this sort of secret desire to be a fiction writer. Okay. And uh, so I came across uh, a lecture that Bradbury had given back in 2001, which I, I know you've yes, seen yeah. because we- <clears throat> I sent it mm-hmm. to you. But uh, that lecture was I I watch it over and over again because it's so ins- it in- it really deeply affected me mm-hmm. and inspired me to kind of tap in to this talent that I knew that I had, but I, I hadn't really developed at all. And so I started to read some of Bradbury's uh, short stories. I, I also got his book, Zen in the Art of Writing. Did you, you started um, with his short stories, basically? or um, Yeah, I, I, well, actually, I, I started with Zen in the Art of Writing, okay. which is his book of essays on the writing craft. Right. And then I kind of transitioned over to his short stories. Uh, I, I read a book of his called uh, Dinosaur Tales, which is all of his stories having to do with dinosaurs, because I'm also kind of a dinosaur nut. Mm-hmm. And so I read his short story, uh, The Foghorn. Yes. Which deeply affected That's the one I, I mistitled it in my email to you, but that one, yeah, that really hit me in a, in a powerful way, too. I'm sure we'll maybe bring that up again, too. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. And, like, <clears throat> after college, for whatever reason, I, I kind of moved on to other writers but in the last few years, I've kind of made him a study of mine. I've been hmm. working my way slowly through all of his collected fiction. I've sure. read uh, The Martian Chronicles, The Illustrated Man, a lot of his anthologies. I haven't gotten to his novels I've yet. I've got here. <laughs> yeah, I, I have those These same, same editions. These are the, with the Simon yeah. & Schuster ones. I picked them up at the beach a few years back. These were great beach books. Nice. Oddly they, enough. They are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot, a lot of Bradbury's short stories are great beach reads because yeah. you can get you can just breeze through them but as i'm sure we'll get into there's so much meat yeah. to a lot of those stories to chew on well like he said in that, that lecture you sent like i said we'll, we'll definitely share that in a bunch of goodies down at the the show notes in addition to to information on how to uh, keep track of of what you're up to as well but you know i love that in that lecture where um i forget where he was in that was it like usc or something I, he was at some college i don't remember it was in southern <clears throat> california i yeah. forget which university and he's exactly. speaking to writers and everything but it was just so frank and so uh it was it was so funny but i i love like you said so much of what he said in that and and um the stories he tells and all the inspiration and everything of uh, you know as far as his outlook on life his childlike sense of wonder you know his determination i, I just i thought it was very humble and frank portrayal yeah um that that really struck me i hadn't really heard um i don't know if i'd ever really heard him before i was mostly you know like like you said i was one of those who did uh read fahrenheit or fahrenheit 451 in high school and didn't really appreciate it at the time i don't think um and then i don't really know what it was that made me you know i think i just picked up martian chronicles like when i was at the beach like i said i was like oh ray bradbury you know um and you may appreciate now i think i asked you this before real quick um did you say you you are not that familiar with something wicked this way comes or i have not gotten to that one yet i haven't read it well, i i know a bit about it the only reason i'm br- reading his biography that's the only reason i bring it up is because i think my first real introduction to him was when i was a kid and the the, the movie version of that 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 was right. in the making for decades and finally came out like right before so I, I was born in 1984 and i think it came out just a year or two before that or around that time and I saw that when I was a kid, probably younger than I should have, and it freaked me out. Uh, like, I mean, it was like... I, I, I've heard it's a pretty, it's, you know, freaky movie. It was movie bizarre. Jonathan kids, Price, yeah. you know, is so brilliant in that. Um, and uh, there's a, a great cast. But the thing that really freaked me out was there's a scene in the movie with, like, more tarantulas than you can possibly imagine. And oh. I finally decided to read... And I hate spiders. And I wonder sometimes if that memory of that movie partly generated an arachnophobia or something in me but the point is i finally read it last year um around halloween time because i thought it'd be cool and i was just it was such an incredible read um but i was surprised to find at least uh, you know at this moment as i try to recall it i don't think that scene with the spiders was in the book i think they added it for the movie and i was like ex- that sounds like something i was extra i was extra mad i was like are you kidding me like i have this like dread now of, of like massive waves of spiders from something that Bradbury didn't even put in his book. No, but, um, but yeah, so that's just to say like, I, you know, um, I had different exposure to his, his work and only recently have started 
going through the the short stories, and uh, I just bought today the hundred uh, coll- was it the hundred short stories collection. It's like yeah. 900 pages long. I, <laughs> I got the Kindle, yeah, the Kindle that, version, so I can take it with me wherever. So, <laughs> but what, what what is it about like him in general? Maybe that that just really when you started really reading him, because I think it's interesting. You seem to approach it more from the, the the advice and the technical side, like the the mastery side of it as a writer. Um, right. When you started reading his work, what what are some things that really jumped out at you about his style or or his approach, his themes, those kinds of things? What struck me is that he was just so different from any other genre writer I had read, and certainly from the other science fiction writers, his contemporaries, Mm. like, say, Arthur C. Clarke or Isaac Asimov. In fact, he's often wedged in between those two. They call them the the ABCs of science fiction, Asimov, Bradbury, and Clarke. But he's really nothing like the two of them. Yeah. Like, they're they're more kind of... Asimov and Clark are more of the grandfathers of what today we would call hard science fiction. Sure. Okay. And Bradbury saw himself actually as more of a fantasy author. He's, right. In fact, he's <clears throat> probably the progenitor of what today we would call kind of like magical realism. Hmm. Or like fantasy set in a contemporary setting. Okay. Rather than a made-up world like Narnia or Middle Earth, and just the sure. fact that he's able to bring these fantasy elements, these bizarre, sometimes very bizarre, yeah. fantasy <laughs> elements, and make them fit in a real-world setting, right, was just so fascinating to me, and it really inspired the the kind of short stories that I've tried writing when I do it myself. Okay. Well, and he, you know, some of his influences, I, I wrote a couple things down <clears throat> just trying to look at my notes, uh, you know, because um, I didn't give a whole lot of detail at the the beginning of the show uh, in the intro. But um, just to situate him here, you know, he's born in 1920, dies in 2012, and he writes mm-hmm. for, what, you know, over 75 years of that time. <laughs> he's yeah, he started writing. writing when he was 12. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, well, so 80 years. Yeah, he died just shy of 92. Um, and he, you know, again, like there's a lot of biographical details he gives in that video we keep talking about uh, that you can check out for more details later. But um, what, uh, you know, based on your kind of knowledge of his background, um, what about his education maybe in, inspired, as far as like his education, I should say, in his style, you know what I mean, <laughs> of, of right. how he learned and kind of developed and sort of filled himself with this framework or this vocabulary. Um, Do you want to mention anything about that perhaps, or just, you know, those influences maybe? I I think you kind of hit on it because he is, he's a, he's a very, oh, what's the word? He, he likes to take in all kinds of influences. Mm. And I believe he, he was a voracious reader from very young and just absorbed basically everything he read i mean like he admits like his early influences being like you know edgar rice burroughs right. <clears throat> or jules verne or hg wells sure. or uh, the 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 oz books. is that burroughs is that's a john carter right that, yes yeah, okay. john carter mars sure. tarzan sure oh well, right and so he 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 absorbed this kind of pulp science fiction so bradbury was submitting to the uh, the pulp magazines early in his writing career and you know he had been influenced by a lot of that kind of writing but his stories were on another level, and in fact, editors recognized it because they would say things to him like, well, Ray, what, why don't you write traditional ghost stories or traditional science fiction stories? And he's like, I don't do that. I have my <laughs> own, you know, his, he, he really wanted to explore. The, the, if you read one of Ray's stories at face value, you're going to miss something. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important because I think each of his stories centers on a metaphor. Right. And for for him, it's usually something having to do with life, death, grief, other emotions. And w- once you start reading his stories in that light, stories that may come off as weird or odd or sometimes even like – sometimes you read one of his stories and you go, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> like when, when you read it again in the terms in in the light of that he's trying to communicate some kind of deeper metaphor, sure. a whole new world 
opens up in terms of his style. You know who, you, and I don't know if he was influenced by her or not because he didn't mention her. But you know who? He really reminds me similarly to uh, Flannery O'Connor. Um, oh, which, I hadn't thought of that because some of her stuff that's that has that shocking kind of, you know, like oh wow, there's like this is way deeper than I was prepared for kind of reaction. Right. Um, and I, I'm going to have to go back and that, that's just coming to me now because I hadn't read any of O'Connor when I was first starting to read his Red Bradbury short stories, you know, so that, that'd be interesting to check out. Um, but so with you now with uh, maybe say like the Martian Chronicles or the Illustrated Man, um, and I, I must admit I'm not, <clears throat> you're far more, the uh, the expert than me on this, so I I'm not totally up to speed necessarily. Depending on what you would mention to just rattle off, like oh yeah, I remember. But I thought we'd give it a shot. So I don't know. Is there any okay. are there any stories in particular from from doesn't have to be from those, but any any of his short stories in particular that that or at least images or, or things, some examples of those metaphors you're talking about that come to mind. Oh yeah, uh, d- definitely the Martian Chronicles itself, which is not like a true novel. Right. It's really more like an anthology of short stories, just all set on Mars. And he had written them over a series of years, correct? Is that a lot of? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And the weird thing about the Martian Chronicles is that okay, if you're expecting some, if you go into it and you're expecting some kind of hard science fiction uh, chronicle of, you know terraforming mars and what what you know human colonization of the red planet would actually be like you're going to be disappointed and and, because in fact when he was writing the martian chronicles we already knew from the mariner missions and stuff that mars was pretty much devoid of life the so-called canals that everyone had been fascinated Mm -hmm. with for decades were an optical illusion But he includes those heavily in the book, the canals, a whole Martian civilization. Right. But once you start to read the Chronicles closely, you realize that he is using Mars as a metaphor for contemporary mid-20th century American life. Right. That everything about it, all the stories reflect America of his time in some way. And he's holding up a mirror to Americans and by just putting them all in a different location on the red planet. Right. He's able to explore <clears throat> ideas and, and aspects of society. Sometimes that, that may not be that flattering right. to Americans. What was the one? And there's some interesting stuff. Like he discusses, you know, um, uh, he gets at, racial tensions he gets at oh yeah um, you know um uh, the 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 home itself right the you know, kids and their families was it illustrated man where's the i forget if it's in martian chronicles or not but the one with the the room where the kids like they lock the parents out and the velt, the velt that's it yeah the velt is, is one of the wow because that story anticipates video games yeah. television VR. and vr mm-hmm. and it anticipates the problems that that can have on a child who's not emotionally prepared for that. Stuff. Right. And in fact, what I think from this, also from the illustrated man is zero hour, which is one of the most frightening stories I've ever read because it, it, it is about the subversion of youth mm. and how the youth can be turned against their parents and against society. It yeah. Because in, in that story, there are alien invaders who essentially use children oh. as a fifth column. Right. And it was it was something straight out of the Twilight Zone. It's like something you... Yeah. Like it would have been an episode of the Twilight Zone. In fact, Ray had tried for many years to write scripts for the Twilight Zone, but I don't think any of them were accepted. Was that the... Well, they, they, the title for I, was, I, I Sing the Body Electric, wasn't that one? But I don't remember if that was... I don't think that was the Twilight Zone, though. That might have been another sci-fi anthology show. I was thinking about that because I, you know, I mean, yeah. it, you'd think that he would be all over that. I mean, it's it's that time period, and he certainly influenced. It. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think That's, yeah. uh, Rod Serling himself admitted that Ray's work had a huge influence on the Twilight sure. Zone. Sure, like a lot of his stories have kind of the Twilight Zone twist ending. Yeah. Yeah, you know, where it's like, you know, the whole story is really not what it appears to be until the very end. It reminds me a little of those old uh, old Seinfeld episode where he's upset about something, and and you know, I think it was George, 
it was, no, it was Jerry. And he says it was like that. You know, and it's like or it was Jerry or George. I forget. But one of them says, you know, um, it's like that Twilight Zone episode. And they're like, which one? He's like, you know, the one where the guy goes to sleep and he wakes up and everything's different. And he's like, which one is? That? He's like, oh, they were all like that. You know, it's just kind of this dismissive, like, right. But there's something to that because it's like that taking you. Um, uh, well, and this this other lecture I was listening to that I've linked below with um, um, I think it's George Wolf uh, is, is talking about some of this stuff. But he made a really good point in that video that um, that at this time when you have sci-fi and even to this day I think sci-fi that is very escapist, uh, that is very um, uh, positive, not necessarily because you know, but, but po a positivity of like if we could just break free of our shackles yes. and get out there, like we'll really you know, somehow not have original sin coming with us anymore. You know, and what's amazing right. is for someone, and, and you can talk, speak maybe more about this, you know, someone who, I, as I understand it, was not exactly a, you know, uh, card-carrying, orthodox, practicing, professing Christian. Um, his recognition of the, the fall in human nature and that we take it with us everywhere we go to the point where you read his Martian Chronicles and every single one of them is about, like, basically looking at ourselves in the mirror, you know? Yes. So maybe like just, you know, we could, we could focus on that maybe a little bit too. those themes of, you know, the inescapability maybe of our, of our fallen human nature, but by our right. own it's, steam, it's like, right? We can't get it on our own steam, get away from it. Like at, at the same time, Bradbury is enamored by space travel and by technology, but at the same time, he's also, mm -hmm. A bit skeptical of it. He he's he recognizes that there's a dark side, that mm. fallen humans will inevitably corrupt technology. That there will always be a dark side. Sure. You know, like uh, that's why you know stories like you know the Velt, which explores you know like electronic entertainment, you know, are so memorable. Um, but yeah, a lot of science fiction and a lot of his peers were very enamored by the whole myth of progress. Mm -hmm. You know that that kind of reaches its apotheosis in Star Trek, right? I was just where it's say. like you know, Star, <laughs> yeah. yeah, where Star Trek is this idyllic future. There's no money, there's no war, mm -hmm. at least on Earth, right? And and like, you know, it's almost like if, if we can just take this utopia that we've finally achieved on Earth out there, like we can, yes. we will seed this this benevolent, you know, um, spirit elsewhere. You know, it's almost like a colonization, you know, approach in a way. Oh, yeah. And, and that's all over his Martian Chronicles. And I, I'm not sure if this one is in the Chronicles or not, but there's a story of his called The Other Foot, which is probably one of the most, sub, at least in today's society, would be considered very subversive because it's about racial tension. Hmm. And it was written during the height of the civil rights era, the kind of 50s and 60s. And it's a story where um, to escape persecution in the United States, most African Americans have migrated to Mars. Mm -hmm. And they found a society there where they can you know, live free of persecution. Mm -hmm. And a nuclear war ends up happening on Earth. That happens in a lot of his stories where we end mm -hmm. up destroying ourselves in nuclear war. But in any case, the the rest of America tries to escape up to Mars and the African Americans who are already living there, you know, get riled up by this one person who says, you know, they're just going to follow us here and persecute us again. And in fact, I'm going to lynch those people mm. as soon as they get here to Mars in retaliation for all the evil we've suffered mm -hmm. due to slavery and racial injustice like he he wants to get back he wants retro re, retributive justice right but then he know he sees these refugees and they're just ragged they've escaped a nuclear war they have nothing yeah and this guy who was going to murder these people for what they had did to for to african americans for centuries is just overcome with i i can't do mm. it I can't do it. And it's a it's a story about racial reconciliation. Right. You know, which is just so important today because it's, you know, retributive justice and all that kind of stuff is all over the news. Well, and interestingly, is your now is your shirt is that Hunger Games? Uh no, actually it's not. <laughs> a funny story behind this shirt. This is um 
It it's in the shape of a phoenix, mm-hmm. and it is actually the logo of a uh, comic book hero called the Phantom Phoenix, which is published by a small Catholic comic book company oh. called Voyage Comics. Oh, very cool! And the the Phantom Phoenix, funny enough, is is an African American superhero. He's a noir crime fighter from the 1920s, <laughs> and I I actually helped story edit the oh, first wow. issue. So the publisher sent me. Oh, that's so cool! This, uh, this very nice shirt. But. Well, it's it's weird. the reason I bring up uh, Hunger Games. All, all kind of interesting connections happening here today. That that often happens on the Gracious Guest yeah. Show. But um, but with the the reason I ask is because it reminded me a little bit there. You know, the spoiler alert if you haven't seen the movies or read the books. But you know, in the I didn't read the books. I saw the movies, and I, I remember right. being. I, I thought it was a good discussion starter when you get to the end and Julianne Moore's character. You know, the the who's the new president, right? And then after all this yeah. suffering. And you know, they finally get rid of what was uh, what was the bad guy's name? Snow. Snow. Donald yeah. Sutherland is brilliant, by the way. <laughs> but um, <laughs> and, I, you know, and the older Key forgets, he's just turning into his dad. You know, it's, it happens. But um, anyways, you know, it's so I thought it was brilliant to have that in there, where it's like, okay, now after all this, these these times are behind us. Here we are, and what are we going to do with this this moment? Let's have our own Hunger Games and punish the ones who. And you're like, no, like what? Like right. what is you know? But is is but that's so isn't human. that what we do, right? I mean, yeah, um, you know, yeah, and, and I, I could list some examples, but I, you know, of course, we don't want to necessarily get off topic per se with with uh, some of those. But that that theme, you know, of I feel like it's not so much. Would you would you think it's fair to say? And maybe you can speak to this a little bit to maybe say that Bradbury is one of those authors who doesn't so much even attempt to supply answers, but gives us great questions. Absolutely, that, and yeah. I think he would say I that think, too, from what I've, I've I've seen with some of that, where he 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 wasn't out to try to solve necessarily anything. He was really good at highlighting the problem, though. <laughs> right? Yeah, I think he he says in in his lecture, I don't write stories to benefit the world. If they do, great, <laughs> but I don't set out to do yeah. that. And he, I think he respects his readers enough not to lecture to them, not to pontificate to mm. them. Or to provide a sort of canned answer. Yeah. But just to say, here's the problem. What do you think? Right. You know? Like, he's he's just very good at... A lot of his stories are open-ended, and that might strike some people as unsatisfying. Hmm. But to me, it just inspires me to, to explore that more and ask more questions. And, like, a lot of his stories involving spirituality or the supernatural work that same way where he he doesn't claim to have the answers Mm -hmm. like he himself i don't think he he would have described himself as a christian he certainly admired christianity Mm -hmm. and the bible and jesus christ but he didn't claim to have one set of truth or the answers but he's he's always exploring i think he there's a a similarity In a different kind of way. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I, I see. Uh, I think in in some of his, his the broad appreciation, the, the the goal of being a very very well read person, you know. And as as he mentioned, you know, of course, having you know, you basically collect thousands and thousands of stories and metaphors, and you, and you know, if you do that, you commit to it the way he did. Uh, I think they said he spent at least three days a week, he'd, he'd just, just be in the library for hours, you know, for 10 yeah. years or, or more. And, you know, you inevitably come to a collection, as he said, of, of you know, all those metaphors bouncing around in your head. They're bound to produce some sparks and some, some new metaphors, you know. Right. And I, I also see, you know, I, I get a lot of that sometimes in some of the work that, for example, like Jordan Peterson has been doing, trying to recover like Joseph Campbell's you know, the, the, right. but this interesting this connection to this idea of, of archetypes and story patterns, and it seems to me like you you know Bradbury probably wouldn't have been comfortable committing to saying that like well in our like from our perspective here that well there that's all true, but there is an ultimate archetype like that Christ Himself you know is the archetype you know, um, but but I think he at least definitely seems to have appreciated you know, the biblical motifs and, and, you know, these, these images because he had such a respect for, for that aspect of our imagination and those, uh, um, those common kinds of, of, uh, story elements that connect with people across various cultures, if that makes sense. 
Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I think he had a profound respect for the Bible, maybe not as revelation from his mm. point of view, but certainly as literature. Right. And as like as a fountain that has been, you know, essentially overflowing and watering literature ever since. Right. You know, because like, you know, Shakespeare and Dante and Tolkien, they're all pulling from the Bible. They all have that deep biblical sensibility. Right. And I, I think Bradbury in some ways does too. I, I know I, I mentioned in, in the notes I had sent over to you that he has this profound sense of grace and the supernatural breaking into ordinary life. Right. And just upending it. Right. The Jesus the Jesus getting in your boat kind of thing, right? You know? <laughs> Exa yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Or like coming in, in into Zacchaeus's life yes. in the, the, the gospel story and just overturning it, you know, like... And or got, you know, God calling to, to young Samuel, right? You know, and it's just yes, completely yeah. like running to Eli, right? Like the way you, the false interpretation, you know, like I'm here and he keeps, I love that story. He keeps waking up Eli, the priest and the old man's trying to sleep, yeah. you know, like that's not, well, I didn't call you, but that idea of something completely other than any category yes. you're tracking on is trying to get in, you know, um, even I think Carl Sagan had a really interesting, there's a YouTube video floating out there of him doing a really interesting teaching on trying to understand how, if we're living in a two dimension, you know, if you imagine us living two dimensionally and something third dimension wants to even begin to communicate and it's above us, we have no notion of above, you know, so like, right. what, what? Like, I, yeah. so that was a very profound kind of thing. Like, you know, we, I think we're very quick to be like, well, why doesn't God do this? Or why don't, why don't angels do that? But I, I feel like Bradbury would be the first to be like, I don't know about God. I don't know about angels specifically may be revelatory, but it, at least to have this appreciation for this this sense of otherness or or i can't quite put my finger on it but it's there it's just behind the veil i, I feel like that really comes through uh without maybe he, him even meaning for it you know it's almost like an inspiration in a sense and that comes through in his writing yeah because he, he the way he wrote stories uh, he he liked to say that it, there was a saying of his that like every morning i wake up and step on a hand grenade <laughs> and what he what, what he meant by that is every morning i get up and I just write off the top of my head, drawing from my subconscious. Hmm. I, I really wish I could do that, yeah. but I'm, I'm I'm not that kind of writer. Yeah. But you you notice in his stories sometimes they're very stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But they oh, but somehow he's just able to draw from all these different sources these terrific uh, metaphors, you know, and like and, and and sometimes you notice that he's writing off the top of his head and not referring to notes or anything. There, there's a story um, by him uh, called the Messiah, hmm. which is about uh, priests on Mars, uh, you know, trying to evangelize the human settlers. There. Right. And I, I don't think that one's actually included in the chronicles. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that that one is in I Sing the Body Electric. Oh, it is okay. Actually, and in 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 that story. Um, he retell one of the priests retells that famous scene uh, from I believe the end of John's Gospel, where the apostles meet the risen Lord on the seashore, and they eat with him. But you can tell right. he's not looking at his Bible when he does this because he gets the, all the details of the story almost completely wrong. <laughs> he 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 has the core of yep. the story there. <laughs> he's got the sense of it, but he gets almost all of the details wrong. And but in the end it doesn't really matter because it's just working into the the greater metaphor that he's trying to communicate with that story. Sure. And but with, it's funny with that story because it's it's in his Martian stories. The Martians can assume they have telepathic powers and can assume basically any form they want right. based on the thoughts of the humans they're interacting with. And so this priest comes across a Martian hiding in his church, and the Martian appears to him as Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And the priest, even after realizing that it, it's not the risen Lord, it, it's a Martian, he can't help but compel the Martian, look, you've got to come back every year at Easter so that I can experience this again. <laughs> and when I was reading when I was reading that, I'm like, see, okay, so, since he's not a Catholic like you and I are, and, and I'm sure many of your listeners are, Bradbury doesn't get our profound connection 
to the Eucharist, mm -hmm. right? That we, we already have Jesus Christ with us. We don't need any facsimile. Right. Like this Martian essentially dressed up as Jesus. And I, I'm like, this character, this priest, I'm like, you're a priest. You should know better. Well, you know what it almost <laughs> makes me think of, I, you know, and this just hit me now is, well, I mean, again, a great discussion starter is like, you know, and, and you want to be careful how you do this, of course, but, you know, where like in our, in our parishes in our schools you know where are there certain small t traditions that maybe we're over stressing you know or or almost making right. like a fixture of worship where it's like like it's i'm i'm thoroughly convinced you know and this is something that comes up in my you know uh, uh teaching a lot just as, as a theology teacher i i i keep tracing like the the older i get the more i read the old testament and new i i just think idolatry it's just our fundamental, like, the, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's just, that's it. It's, it's placing something at the top, in the top seat that doesn't belong there, you know, and, uh, yeah. and I've, I've witnessed, you know, in parish work, you know, like fights, like unchristian fights over paint color, you know, in the parish halls, right. you know what I mean? Like, so, so I almost feel like, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's not where he's going with it, but what an interesting potential connection there is, is there something in my mind that I'm equating almost or I'm projecting, you know, into this, this essential aspect of Christ himself. That's maybe not, or maybe it's yeah. standing in the way of the real McCoy, you know? And it, it, it's so funny because even when, you know, even when he quote unquote gets it wrong, like he doesn't stick to what we would consider Orthodox mm -hmm. Christian teaching, even in these sort of like quote unquote errors, there's always something to chew on, something to talk about. It always, like, engages me to, to think about these topics on a deeper level. Mm. Like, I, I was talking to someone recently who just rejected Bradbury's, you know, stories of this kind. Right. By saying, oh, he gets, he gets Christianity so wrong. And I'm like, that's, that's not the point. Right. Like, so, you know, like... So does Star Wars. No, you know what I mean? Like, right, yeah, it's, it's like... <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, you know, he... At, at, I give him a lot of credit for engaging with the supernatural when a lot of his contemporaries were all about scientism. Right. Just science... Like you yep. were saying, is science is our idol. It's our messiah. You know? Yeah. Right. It, it, it's our idol. It will save us. And we have to be super scientifically accurate. We can't even have a whiff of the supernatural or its fantasy. Mm. And Bradbury's like, no, because he, I think he intuited that the supernatural is a part of life. Yeah. And I think that's why even in his stories that have no sci-fi element to them at sure. all. And they're, they're actually, he wrote more of those kind of stories than, than you would think. Hmm. But even in his stories about the completely mundane, there's just this sense of wonder and joy about life yeah that he clearly recognizes that in our most mundane experiences there's something just underneath that's giving life to all of it right oh check this out this is a <laughs> this is a god moment you want to get ready for this connection this is this is a bit of a leap but uh that reminds me of a, a book i often recommend to people by um He's, he just passed away, I think, last year, but uh, Tom Howard, literature professor up in Boston for many years, wrote a book called um, uh, Chance or the Dance, uh, a, uh, uh, a critique of modern secularism. He wrote it in 1969, before he was Catholic, and uh, it's hard to describe. It's a short little book, and it's just saturated with just the unescapable, inescapable, sacramental reality of the universe itself. Like just that, and he, his, his thesis is that there's, um, I have a whole show on this for, for listeners to, and want viewers of the show, go back and watch the whole episode, but here's a quick taste of it. Um, he basically pitches it at the beginning as there's, he goes, there was an old myth and there's a new myth. He says the old myth was that everything means something. The new myth is that nothing means anything. And I definitely yeah. think Bradbury would not subscribe to that secularist, nothing means anything. You know, and, and oh, what's no, he, what's neat is Tom Howard in that book has a chapter called Of Borzois and Dish Rags. And he goes into this, you know, in, in another chapter called Bravo the Humdrum, where he's, he's approaching this very same thing of wonder in the daily minutia. Um, mm -hmm. And 
that uh, what what jumped to mind is this is so funny. I just discovered as I'm sitting here with you that this book it's called Stories of the Sea, Every Man's Pocket Classics. Uh, from get this, um, this is a Borzoi book. So there's even a connection. <laughs> but this uh, this is a, a book of different you know sea related stories. It has you know it's an anthology, and I love the ocean. I love all things you know, seaside, whatever. And uh, so this has a you know, Hemingway and Robert Louis Stevenson and Poe. And, but the first story in it is Ray Bradbury, the Foghorn. Oh my. And gosh. I just, I, I just want to share this one very brief little line. That's just so, uh, and maybe uh, if you want to tell us a little more about this, you know, in general, but the only thing I want at the beginning, um, the, uh, the main character is, is just, just, you know, just uh, talking to this younger character. And I just love this. Listen, like Bradbury at his best. He says, um, talking about this creature that, that has been hidden out in the deep. And he says, no, he says, only hid in the deeps. Deep, deep down in the deepest deeps. Isn't that a word now, Johnny? A real word. It says so much. The deeps. There's all the coldness and darkness and deepness in a word like that. I love it. I, you know, it's that... only a poet. And he read a yeah. lot, he, uh, poems every day, day and night, you know, and I feel like that yeah. comes through. He, he writes mostly in prose, you know, but, but it's just poetic, you know. He's, that was vintage Brad. Yeah. Because he's one of the most poetic prose writers yeah. that I've ever encountered, you know. And, like, yeah, that, that story was so affecting. It's funny because that story, The Foghorn, it w eventually mutated into the... 50s B movie, the, feet, right. uh, the Beast from Twenty Thousand Fathoms. Yeah, I, I love, I love that. It's movie. fun. It's great, but it has nothing to do. No. Basically, the, the only thing that's the same is that the monster destroys a lighthouse. Right. But like the, the, that story itself is not a kind of shallow B movie creature feature type thing. Right. It, the story is really a meditation on loneliness and. Grief through a different species. And loss, like a, yeah, like what through a dinosaur. What do we relate to less than a dinosaur? I mean, in terms of like right. an emotional. But yeah, he 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 pulls it off, and like you feel for this dinosaur, which is which emerges. What is it? Is it every year or ten years or something? It, it comes to the foghorn every year. Yeah, yeah. You got You just got to read it. You know, if you. I mean, that's the thing is we don't want to tell them too much. You know, it's just right. wet yeah, the appetite exactly. to go read the thing. It's just you know. Um, so I, I don't know. Well, Tom's. I mean, there's so much more we could talk about. I don't know. Just maybe the, to maybe start moving towards a, a temporary finish line for now. Is there anything else you just would love to kind of make sure we, we we cover? Maybe open up a little bit for anyone who might want to appreciate Bradbury more. Um, I, I think I would just want to touch on uh, his story. I believe it's from the Illustrated Man. Yeah, it, it's a story called The Man, hmm. and that one really hit me as like you know his sort of completely rejecting scientism mm -hmm. because he, he it's about these space explorers who visit a planet and they kind of slowly begin to realize that Christ has become incarnate on this planet as well. <laughs> like a lot of science fiction writers have tried to address the question of, well, what does Christianity mean to aliens? Right. And, and like we said before, uh, Bradbury doesn't claim to have the answers. But he poses a lot of interesting questions. And there's a, a character, one of the astronauts, who completely rejects any of this notion that it, it could be Jesus Christ or that there's anything supernatural going on. He mocks the witnesses. He trusts more in his little right. scientific instruments than right. he does the, the humble witness of these people. But even he, towards the end, realizes that he's hungering and thirsting for something that the simple natives of this planet has, have found. Hmm. But he, with all his technology and his spaceships and his gizmos, doesn't have. Wow. And it drives that character a little bit crazy towards the end, where, like, you know, he, he, he wants to, to grasp on to Jesus Christ. He, he demands to see this mysterious figure. And when that is not forthcoming... He threatens to shoot somebody right. <laughs> over it, and it's like you just, and they keep telling him like you'll never find him that way. Yeah, you know, but he he doesn't understand. It was just such a powerful story. Yeah, you know, and like I said, provides no answers, but gosh, has some in, intriguing questions to just unpack. Well, and that, and that reminds me a little of the. I was just had to double check the um, maybe again that fundamental that fundamental thing of that grasping for the fruit. 
right? Oh, it's, yeah. You're, you're going to have it. God wants you to have it more than you do, but you can't take it for yourself, or then it's not it. You know, it's, it's, you know, Frodo, you know, it's, it's, it's Gollum versus Frodo. It's like that image that shows up in so much literature. Cause I think we know deep down that you can paint that picture so many ways. Bradbury does such an amazing job at it, but at the end of the day, it's just that, it's that mirror for ourselves. Yeah. It's this journey we're all on. And I, I think it's fascinating that someone, even someone who would not probably identify as a Christian can see and discuss these topics with such you know intelligence the way bradbury does you know like that that you know a lot a lot of us i i think there's a temptation among christians and and you know and catholics in particular to stick to fellow catholic writers you know and yeah. to just yeah. you know, stick to our, our christians you know stick to tolkien lewis and chesterton mm -hmm. But I think that it's kind of navel gazing, isn't it? A little bit, yeah. A little I, bit, or it can be. It can be because yeah. I think, and as much as I love Tolkien, Lewis, and Chesterton, I just yeah. adore them. Oh yeah, like that, right. that. There are some other writers out there, you know, quote unquote secular writers like Bradbury, whose work can really teach you something if if yeah. you're open to it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Thomas, this is this has to continue. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I I definitely will, uh, will will keep in touch with you because I think uh, I've I've gotten a lot out of this today for sure and, and um, excited because we're just scratching the surface even just with Bradbury oh, we yeah. can do a deep dive on one particular book a story whatever or uh, multiple other topics I'd love to have you back on to whatever Star Wars comics I don't know so this this show is all about you know living with wonder and awe as I as I say or showcasing it you know however you want to put it so. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on today. Well, thank you, Mike. It, it's been an absolute blast, and I, I, I would love to be on to talk about any of those topics because I'm, I'm one of those nerds who can just talk about this stuff for hours <laughs> and never get tired of it. And I know my Same. family gets tired of hearing me talk about it, so <laughs> maybe we'll try it on your guests. That sounds good. It's a good platform for it. So God bless you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Mike. Well. That made me feel pretty much like a kid in a candy store. Uh, just a tremendous, tremendous time. Uh, it was such a pleasure. I'm so uh, grateful uh, for Thomas having come on here today. He's definitely going to be back. What's funny is even before we officially got off the call, we're committing to uh, some future projects as well because we want to talk about dinosaurs more. <laughs> he has a really very fascinating background with, uh, with that from his time that he spent working um, at the... Uh, Museum of Natural History in New York doing all kinds of fossil archiving and cool stuff like that. But we'll have to save that for another time. So thank you so much for tuning into The Gracious Guest Show. TheGraciousGuest.org is the website. Also, all of the goodies below in the show notes here. Make sure you check that out to get more information about Ray Bradbury, more information about Thomas, where you can find his work. And uh, stay tuned because you'll see him back on here for sure. God bless you guys. And until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care. <laughs>